Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, and even ice in it. Frappuccino. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, praise God. Shall we uh, bow our hearts before him and ask him to speak to us in his word, out of his word, and by his spirit? Do you want to hear from him? And you're the one that has the door. Open your door to him. Let him come in and speak. Lord, you are our great God. You know, you know what's already in the can of worms inside of us. <laughs> so you're not going to make any discoveries if we open our heart to you. Instead, you have the supply and what we need to come out of our can of worms and in to you. You open doors and we ask you to open a door for us and bring in your great presence to where we are to detach us from anything that would beset us to coming to where you are. No man can close a door that you opened. So open your door to us and help us walk through into your presence. Give us wisdom to recede from you. And spiritual understanding beyond our own understanding. Our understanding gets us in trouble. It's only by your spirit, in your spirit, through your spirit. That we have any understanding of you. So help us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I one time uh, worked in the oil field. I really enjoyed working in the oil field. I started working in the oil field when I was a junior in high school. I was 17 years old, and I worked seven days a week. I worked from midnight till 8 o'clock in the morning, and then I got up and went to school. And I say got up. <laughs> See, I worked all night, right? I drove home and changed clothes, and... My first class, my junior year, I was usually a half hour late, but the principal never tagged me as late. And my first hour of class never tagged me as late. They said, no, you're working. You're supporting yourself. You're really doing life. It is not your intention to cut school. My parents had moved from the town that I lived in. They asked me to go with them. They knew I was a very responsible person, had been for a long time probably since I was six. <laughs> I mowed my first yard when I was six and kept mowing yards and kept doing whatever. If somebody wanted their garbage cleaned out, I would go do that. If they wanted their alley cleaned up, I would do that. You know, the first yard that I cut was with a pair of ladies' scissors because I had no lawnmower. Now, in my progression and growth, I understood what work was. I understood that life is real and that you had to become real to interact with life. Along the way, I, working there in the oil field, I developed some understanding of the craft, and it is a craft. It's playing with the biggest toys on earth in, the, in industry, uh, the heaviest, dutiest equipment that there is. Some of the lifts that we were doing were over two million pounds in pulling up and drilling in the earth, and there's a real art to that that I learned. But in the midst of that, I got good enough at my craft that I uh, was hired to go out to sea. And those guys that work out at sea are like college level. They do not accept novices out there. They do not accept those who do not know how to work, nor those who do not know how to think, nor those who have problems in their psychology with each other. Why? Because you're in closed quarters and six men sleeping in a room that's probably 12 by 12 and having a hundred men on one platform can sometimes be quite arduous if you have uh, a lot of violence in the heart there. There were a lot of violent men that I worked with. Now, my point in telling you this is I graduated, I, I learned different skills and I can remember being at sea and working at sea and uh, really enjoying it. I really enjoyed my work. I enjoyed working 12 hours a day 
It, uh, it made you appreciate when you were off. You used your time wisely. I also got to see God do many things. I saw many men perish and many men in peril. Because the work that we did, you put your life on the line. It was not uncommon for if you were off for a week to come back and somebody had lost an arm or a leg or perhaps a life. It was not uncommon that somebody fell from maybe a hundred feet out of the derrick down to the floor or was crushed by some pump. That was almost, it seemed like, a monthly occurrence that something was going like that was going on in our small circle. <clears throat> now if you incorporated all the oil field together, the, the deaths, the amputations, the, the, the things that happened to our bodies, was, it was significant. Uh, the government helped us and put a uh, $100,000 limit that if you got killed, your family got $100,000. I'm not racking down on the government, but life was cheap. Now, we also lived in a real zone of having to do something really dangerous. But I can tell you, having worked there, having been that, having gone through that, it was a couple of occasions that we had hurricanes come through, and I was about probably 300 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico, which it puts you, I don't know, way out there. I think it's about 700 miles down to the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula, or 800, something like that. And uh, I noticed that we'd been having winds, which we got wind on a regular basis out there. We'd been having winds for about three days of maybe 50, then 60 miles an hour the next day, and then 70 miles an hour the next day, and 80 miles an hour the next day. And You know, I, I, was, I got off tower, went in, and I was listening as I heard... Uh, uh, because yeah, uh, all those rigs are shortwave and all that stuff. You could hear that the rigs around us that were 40, 50 miles from us, because they were all looking for, see what's out there. And uh, we could hear uh, Laughlin 82 was shutting down, and Pensco 23 was shutting down. And, and, I, and I radioed in and said, hey, are you guys finished with your, with your project there? And, uh, how come, you know, you, there's, you're stacking out? And, and they said, well, fool, there's a hurricane coming. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why weren't we told? Why weren't we told? It was a massive hurricane headed our way. And the leadership decided not to tell us, thinking, well, it could turn and not come upon that particular rig. <laughs> it could, it might turn, <laughs> you know. I, I later found out it was just a straight beeline all the way across the Atlantic and if you drew, drew a bull, bullseye where we were that's where it was headed the whole time and it never turned it never turned and here it comes and they said oh yeah yeah it, it's coming we're not going to dodge the bullet so you guys get ready and shut down and we'll get you off and, well we're already up to now 100 mile hour winds now keep in mind the rig floor is 100 feet off the water it's got a huge stand that goes down in the water, some 500 feet, and it's probably a half mile wide at the bottom with pipe that is 8 to 12 feet in diameter welded together in a tree that comes up and then a platform shoots on up, and it's the size of a football field that the final shooting up of it. The bottom of it's like six blocks wide each direction. The top of it's 100 yards by 100 yards of just sticking out of the water. 100 feet out of the water. Uh, I would tell you there's a reason that the bottom deck was 100 feet out of the water. <laughs> there was a reason. That's when the winds were reaching 100 miles an hour, there was waves that were 70 to 80 feet tall coming through there. Our Derek man, they, they radioed and said, okay, you guys are going to have to button down all the hatches and, you know, hang off all the pipe and, you know, that means you're going to have to run it out of the hole and then run it back in and you're going to have to lay it down and all that stuff. And Derek man said, I quit. The wind is blowing 100 miles an hour here at 100 feet and I work another 165 feet up there in the air. I am not going up there. 
you want to really put my life in jeopardy. Because you climbed a ladder up to, going up there. 165 feet. And you're 265 feet off the water. And the crown of the thing is another 100 feet in the air. I used to go up there and look. But, oh, beautiful, beautiful from up there. It was a long time to get up there climbing on a little ladder. Derek, Derek Mann quit. I, at that time, had uh, many jobs, many hats on the drilling rig. I uh, ran all the engines. They were EMDs. They were, uh, you know, 16 cylinders that were about two foot in diameter each cylinder. It took nearly 300 gallons of oil to change the oil on one of the engines. And I was in charge of all the electrical circuits and all the electricity producing all that and all the mechanics on the rig. I had graduated and really learned my craft well and going through all the different things, including drilling and including working derricks. I did my turn on working derricks up there. I never will forget the guy that taught me how to work derricks, you know. I, I said, you know, because you got paid more, you know. You're working down on the floor, and those guys get mashed and drilled into the ground and it's crushed and all that stuff all the time. And the guy up there, he just falls. So, and there's stuff flying everywhere that weighs thousands of pounds down on the... Our, our, little, our little wrenches were... Uh, the, the ranch that I used on the floor, they were called tongs. They weighed 1,200 pounds, one set of them did. And you had to bring out over latch jaws that were that thick in steel around something. And you had a cable pulling 36,000 pounds standing right beside you with a chain whipping on the end of it. I can go on and tell you about all the things I was exposed to and dangers. I remember the guy that taught me how to work Derek's, the older guy. He climbs up the ladder and he's... <laughs> He's got this kid up there. And it was a standard derrick that I went out on. I'd been up in a, uh, the other type of derrick, which are smaller. You could, there's always something to grab when you're up in the top of one of those. A standard derrick, it, 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 it's, it's a good 24 feet across it on the inside, up that high, and it's a good 40 feet across it at the bottom. And uh, when I got up in the standard derrick, there's this single plank that's two foot wide that goes out 10 feet from the edge of the derrick to put you in the center to line up with the floor down below. It's two foot wide. There's nothing on it. It's 100 feet to the floor. You got a little belt on with a rope on. They didn't have harnesses in those days. It's a leather belt with a rope that went through it. Now, the rope was big, grant you. But it didn't attach to anything else on you. Many a time I've seen a guy dangling from up there. And the guy, he says, okay, we're drilling, so you're safe. And there's all these lines that are like two inches in diameter. There's like 20 of those hanging in front of me with grease dripping from them. set of blocks below me. And he said, put your feet on the end of the thing, move your toes over the rack, take the rope, hang on to it, and start leaning out and leaning out and leaning out and leaning out and lean until finally you're leaning at this angle and the rope's the only thing holding you. And he said, now get used to it. Get used to the height. I sit out there for a while and then learn how to rock back and forth and all that stuff and got pretty stable. My heels are the only thing that are hanging on that board with me projecting forward. Why? Because you had to be in that position when the blocks were coming up so that you could grab the bales and unlatch those or drop the pipe into it as, and then pull yourself back as the blocks come flying by you. When he was training me, I could hear him snickering. Well, Sonny, it's time. It looks like you need a little slack. <laughs> and he just spun off about two feet of rope. And what that did, it dropped me just straight out like this. It gave me my first understanding of what it would be like if I fell. It was frightening. It was absolutely stifling. I, I almost froze. It was so frightening. So I was trained well in fright. <laughs> we had the ability to do that in the oil field to each other and laugh when someone else was going through it. And then when the hurricane comes, they know I work, Derek's, and they say, we've got to do this. They won't let us out the platform unless we've got everything tied down. Will you go up and, and do this? And I, I lay there, the Derek man has quit. 
Now, they couldn't force the Derrick man. I knew the Derrick man. He was like seven foot tall, ex-football player. Loved taking knives away from people. Loved fighting. His arms were about this big around. Could lift 700 pounds without even blinking an eye. They weren't dare going to tackle him and make him go up there. Anyway, I, I, I yeah, I'll, I'll go up there. I went up there. And I've got a joint of pipe, and a joint of pipe, there's three of them screwed together, weighs about 6,000 pounds. I got hold of it with my arm, I walk out, and we're trying to run everything into the hole. And then finally weld everything off, because that would help hold it. You get, you get a million pounds pulling down on something, it holds it in position as the wind hits. That was their thought process. I've got hold of this pipe, it weighs 6,000 pounds, but it's standing on its nose. So I, I have about probably 300 pounds of it in my arm, and I'm wrestling it out to the end, and they come running the blocks up. Now keep in mind, 120 mile hour winds by now, and the blocks are swinging like this, 20 feet. And I have to time those, that when the blocks come by, the bales are bent forward, drop that pipe into that, and snap those things shut. It took six hours to do that, when generally it took less than probably 45 minutes for us to do that because the winds were impaling us so much. I remember seeing the ocean in such rage that you think, oh my goodness, can this withstand what's coming? Because it, it wasn't there yet. <laughs> it wasn't, they're still telling us it's coming. <laughs> you know, we got 120 mile an hour winds and they're telling us it's coming. It's very moving very, very slow. My heart was set that, Lord, I am yours. I could see men, big, strong, bully-type men, which it takes kind of that attitude of no fear to work in that environment, begin to crumble in their inner thinking and inner man, frightened. His rig is, it's moving. Every time an 80-foot wave is coming by and hitting it, it's moving. We finally got secured and... They said, okay, we can't fly helicopters because the wind's going 120 now. And, uh, but we've got a boat down there, and it's a 110-foot work boat, or uh, not a work boat, a crew boat, which has, you know, huge engines to help it stabilize. It had out nearly 4,000 foot of chain, and it had its engines revved up, and its anchor dropped, and it is still dragging chain. And that thing, it's going 70 feet in the air, and then it crests over and half the vessel is laying on one side with its props. And then it comes crashing back down into a gully. Keep in mind, if there's a 70-foot wave, that means there's a 70-foot drop. There's a 140-foot difference between the two. They put us in this little basket tied to the crane. We had four cranes on board. And those cranes would swing their booms around. You're on a cable in a basket that's about eight foot across, that's around, with rope bottom in it, wind blowing 120 miles an hour, and it's like this, and the boat's down here, 100 feet, and then up 70 feet, excuse me, where the crane was, we were 180 feet off the water. So there was this difference of 70 foot of the boat going up and down, and it would almost crush your legs as it's coming up, it comes up so fast, it also disappears that fast. They get part of us down on the boat, and they change their mind. Well, we heard it's going to change directions after we spent four hours trying to get the guys off the rig, and they decided it was safer to put us back on the rig because they were worried about whether the boat would be able to pull away and make it and all this stuff by now, you know. I'm in one of those moments that there's great catastrophic things happening in life. I personally was not challenged because of my deep relationship with my Lord. It taught me a lot about some of the things that we face in life. There's all these catastrophic events that are, that are blowing us, all these catastrophic events. Part of that is because we put ourselves in harm's way. Whose decision was it to go after the money? Whose decision was it to go out there and work? Whose decision was it to pursue something that was ultra dangerous? Those were all my decisions. I enjoyed my craft and trade very much, but they were my decisions to put myself in harm's way. My decisions 
knowing that the Gulf of Mexico, which I did not consider, always is Hurricane Alley during hurricane season, right? Always. When has it ever not had a hurricane? There's no time in history it has not had hurricanes in it, especially in the middle of it. So I didn't know I was making a decision when I went to the oil field and went out to the Gulf. I did not know I was making the decision to put myself in harm's way. I did not know the consequence. I did not know the result of making wrong decisions. Matter of fact, uh, not long after that, we were flying back to shore and uh, I was in a twin engine helicopter and one of the engines was going out on it and they didn't know if they were going to get there. And we usually use helicopters that had the floats on it. This particular one did not. <laughs> I don't know if you know, when the engine goes out, these things don't have wings. They don't fly. And that guy limped it in. It was just... <laughs> and just dropped it right on the beach. And he was sweating bullets. I was co-piloting at the time, and he was sweating bullets. And I mean, he was shaking. He didn't think he was going to be able to make it. Because these things crash. They don't, oh, let's hover and jump out. When they're crashing, you can't jump out of them. The blades will make sausage out of you. We landed on the beach. I made a decision when I stepped my foot out of the helicopter. I will not put myself in harm's way out there in the Gulf of Mexico anymore. Wasn't because I was fearful. I got to thinking about it and my crafts and skill that gained so much that now I could go to Alaska where they paid 10 times more and it's 10 times more dangerous. <laughs> where it's 80 below zero and they still have 100 mile an hour winds and there's ice and there's polar bears and what's wrong with this equation? I made a ton of money. Yes, this is back in the 70s. My company paid me 10000 a month and paid all my expenses and all that stuff. And where else could you make that kind of money? But it took you. Here's my life. I'm going to put it on the line. And I'm telling you these things for a reason. We do not calculate out the end result. We just see what we want now. And in that calculation of what we see we want now, we enjoy what we want now. But the end result is death. The end result is having cataclysmic things continually bombard us in our lives. Some of you, no doubt, have gone through some great marital problems. Some of you have gone through great financial problems. Some of us have watched our kids shipwreck themselves. And some of us have shipwrecked ourselves time and time again until we barely have an inner tube left to survive and we just paddle around the inner tube and how's, well, how's life, how are you? We paddle by each other in a little inner tube because we got nothing stable in life and our stability in life is in Jesus Christ. There is no other stability than in Him and I can't have stability in making decisions in my own mind and in my own conscience and in my own thought process. I can't build anything in life that will not be blown away, that will not be threatened unless I am in Him because the Spirit is the one that has to do the building in my life. Matthew seven twenty four. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I, I, I like that. This is Jesus talking. This is God Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. He didn't say whoever reads the Bible. <laughs> he didn't say whoever acts good. He didn't say whoever uh, obeys the Torah. He says whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. So if one, I've got to be able to identify where the rock is. Two, I need the materials to be able to build on the rock. Three, I need to understand and get the wisdom. There's something I need to be building in my life. And there is a location that it is supposed to, a place where it is supposed to be built. And Jesus, who is God, just got through making this statement that you need to pay attention. My lips are moving. I am God and I am telling you something and trying to give you wisdom that can change the outcome of all the storms that are headed your way for your life. He said, he whoever does these things of mine does them. I, I will... Liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, got the storm. 
But I'm not out in the ocean, am I? <laughs> it's a big difference if I'm up on a rock and a hurricane's coming. The rock's going to take the beating. I just stand on it. Or better yet, in a cleft of it. It's got hiding places. I'll be hidden in the rock. It takes the full brunt of the storm. I do not have to. I would have had to take the full brunt of the storm 300 miles at sea. I would have had to take the full brunt of the storm on the sandy shore. Matter of fact, it was more dangerous on the shore than it was where I was at. Hurricane Camille. There was a, a guy that was having a hurricane party in the third story of his beach condo. And, and Hurricane Camille, which had 170 mile hour winds, maybe 200 mile hour sustained winds. And it brought a 60 foot wall of water on shore with it when it came besides the high tide. And he and his whole party crew, the waves came washing right through the front of the condo and washed them all right out the back of it. I think two of them ended up living or hanging in trees some 12 miles inland when they finally found them. Now, you think you can withstand some of the storms of life? I tell you, we face an enemy far greater than a hurricane. We face an enemy, somehow he knows the intricate parts of our heart. He knows how we think. He knows our lust, our desires, and our wants. And he says, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty. I got a mouse for you. Oh, oh, oh mouse. I love mouse. <laughs> you know, that's all we can see. We got the mouse in our eyes. We want it in our teeth. And he is always tempting us to come into that type of situation. That is sure death. It is sure destruction. And we will not have anything. We will again have our, wife, our lives swept away in some area. I know people that have never recovered from some of the emotional stresses that they have put themselves through in times past. And they have all these corpses, you know? Weird twitches. And you think, what, what? What, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was watching a film of a, uh, 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 it was uh, some British film, and there was some guy who was holding a normal conversation sitting at the bar, and the bartender was on the other side, and the guy kept, you know, oh, yes, I was there at Dundee, and it was, it was a great play, 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 and, it, you know, and you're just sitting there, and the guy across the bar was, it, the guy was acting like on this side nothing was going on, but there was some kind of nervous twitch in him, and he, could, he always spoke that away. And it always, so there's something wrong down in deep inside that occurred long ago that was causing that. The other day, uh, we had some friends over for lunch on a Sunday, and our two wonderful little boy dogs that can do no wrong. Uh, Jack is the greatest dog in the world, and Milo, I call him Bozo the Clown. They're Jack Russells. <laughs> and you can. You can have love for Jack Russells, but they're Jack Russells. They're going to bark when you say no. They're going to run and chase when you say no. They're going to be, I can't see anything, Master. I got to get it. <laughs> but oh, how they can love. How they have tenderness of heart and loyalty. But they lose all of that when they see something. They see something, it enters their brain. Their veins stick out, their eyeballs bulge, and they can see nothing else, hear nothing else. And, oh, Master, I must protect the castle. <laughs> and <laughs> we had two little kids out there, and Jack loves kids. Milo, I, I've not seen him around kids much. But while he was out there, these two little kids, he was barking at them. He was, it was serious bark. He was following them intentionally. And he'd get around and he finally, he just keeps doing that and doing that. And they're just ignoring him. They, fortunately, these kids have been dogified. They've been around dogs a lot. And they just ignored them. I mean, they could care less. Just, oh, you're a dog. Who cares? <laughs> you know, and little kids are usually not like that. I just praise God. Oh, thank you, Lord, for sending these kids. <laughs> but it brought something out in Milo. 
Before it was over with, I didn't pay attention. They didn't pay attention to it. He kept inching closer and closer. And finally, he's standing on his front legs. And he is bouncing on them and pushing them. And going, rah! I see him from inside. And I think, oh, Milo. No! And he's still pushing on them. And I reach down and swat him. And he, rah! Rah! And he backs up and rah! And he just starts peeing all over himself in the deck. Something is wrong inside him. He's fearful. I pick him up and the poor little guy is shaken. He's going through some emotional trauma. I could have been the bully and said, you stupid dog, you know. I no. I took him in the house and got him all settled down and put him in his little bed and he's <sighs> later on after he calmed down he come in and he sat down at my feet and just looked up at me and he just melted it. I said, Oh Milo, I, I don't know how to help you. I don't know how to help you. There's been something that's happened somewhere, some storm has damaged you that's causing some sort of reaction. It's not normal. But many of our reactions that we have when we go through great storms and waves are out of our hurts, out of our misconceptions, our misunderstandings. They hurt deeply. But we're doing something wrong as a result of something that we've been exposed to. Bad teaching. Bad people. Bad situation. Bad circumstances. Now, I would submit to you, Milo, he was probably under the tutelage of some little kid that probably had him under his arm, strangling him when he was a puppy, and really went through some brutality. You could see that when he gets around children. He didn't choose that storm. He himself was put into it. So there's many storms that we have gone through that our parents chose. Our husbands or wives chose that we didn't choose that storm. But still, there's some damages down inside of us. But there are many storms now. We get to choose whether we want to be in the storms. We get to choose whether we want to participate in those storms. We get to choose where we build our house. Because there's a place we can build it that it's invincible. There's a place we can build it. It doesn't avoid the storms. It just won't collapse. Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house. And it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. Key number one. If your life is not founded on the rock, it's time to change it. Change its position, its locality. Change your mindset. Founded on the rock means that everything that the rock is, that's what we do, that's what we say, that's what we think, and nothing else. If we bring anything else on board onto the rock, it's sand. And you put sand on a rock and you still have a wheat structure. So I can't mix my sand with his rock. I must leave my sand behind. I was really surprised when, uh, you know, Jackie and I used to be like the Adams family. We were storm chasers for quite a few years. You, you remember them talking about, uh, he, he was talking to his wife, and, oh, Gagia, you remember oh, our, our, our wedding night? Oh, we went to where the hurricane was. <laughs> well, we chased hurricanes. That was a way that we made a living besides pastoring for a few years. Pastoring doesn't pay anything, and chasing storms did. So I could go out and chase a storm and come back and work uh, uh, you know, and gain a little finances so we could survive. And I always was amazed. There's these people that are always building on the beach where there's only sand. You can drill 100 feet down into the ground, there's still only sand. You can go 200 feet, and there's still only sand. And they're building. Oh, it's beautiful. This is where I want to be. The breeze is wonderful. Have you seen the sunsets? Oh, I walk on it. It's peace for me. Well, I, I had a cohort that worked one time for an insurance company that I worked for, and she lived in Homestead, Florida. Homestead. 
I had a hurricane come through there with 170 mile hour winds. Most of the people in Homestead had built for hurricane. We're hurricane proof. We're staying. That storm can't drive us off. They stayed, as most people did there, because he had poured concrete walls, outside perimeter walls, and put in the windows and put up the barricades and all that stuff. I, I went to Homestead after that storm. And I understand why my cohort that had been there and built her career with the insurance company and been there for 15 years and had uh, had all kinds of ample opportunities for advancement and she was she was on fire and all that stuff. She left the state of Florida with her family. I am never going back to Florida and put my family in harm. They spent an entire day and a half with the roof gone and 160 mile hour winds blowing over them, sucking the furniture out, water drenching down on them, flying debris with their little kids huddled with the mattress that they were trying to hold over them. I can understand her statement. I'm not taking my family back there. No matter where you live in Florida, you are exposed to that type of encounter. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on the house and it fell. And great was its fall. I meet many people that call themselves Christians. They just live from one fall to the next. One collapse to the next. One collapse to the next. And they come to me, why is everything collapsing? Must be the devil. Must be those people. And they got a whole list of all the tragedies that other people caused in their lives. It's their fault. Why was I handed this? Now we're blaming God because he's the one who had our eternal destiny in his hand. It's your fault. With no understanding. we just flat building in the wrong spot. We're not building where there's solid truth. Sand represents fragmented truth that's been eroded. A rock represents the whole truth that's not split, not corroded, won't move, can't be blown away. We're not standing in the whole truth and we're not living in the whole truth. We like to go down and dance in the sand. But if you like to dance in the sand, I can tell you, you're going to have a life of collapse and a life of hell and a life of trauma. It is a marvelous thing to have and feel the safety arms of God around you and being on good ground. Even when I worked on the oil rig and was ignorant enough to say, that's the lifestyle that I want, I still had a solid relationship with Jesus that I even, in the midst of that storm, after they got everything buttoned down, I think, you know what? I'm already 265 feet off the water. I'm going to head to the crown in this wind and see the glory of God because the ocean was enraged. And the scripture says that God churns up the deep and God is the one that sets it in rage and, and God's fury was fully being released and I looked down and I looked and I said, Go God! That was my rendition of the storm because I was on the rock. I still a moron in the wrong place at the wrong time, but I still, I, I still, the rock was still under me. Our decisions that we make for our God are eternally important. I noticed after hurricanes and working those, which I, in the last 25 years, there's probably only two hurricanes that I haven't gone to. Maybe more if they had some this year. I don't know. I don't get the news. I remember going to Hurricane Hugo and seeing these huge oak trees. They had, they had this old uh, growth live oak trees that are seven, eight foot in diameter. Huge trees. But the root system of those trees is not like the root system of trees here. Since it's sandy soil, the root system, one tap root, and then these massive roots stretch out as far as they can, so it's like you trying to... Why? Because you got a big top on you. you got a lot of limbs on you. Because these things have limbs that are three feet in diameter sticking out, and some of those limbs stretch out maybe 40 feet one direction. They're amazing trees. They're beautiful trees. 
I took some pictures back. Jackie came out to see me and work with me out there, and I took some pictures back and showed her. I had a picture of a, one of those trees. It was totally blown over, crushed the top of it, crushed, I don't know, a couple of three houses down the way. They're, they're flattened. There's nothing left of them. There's sawdust under there. there. There's probably a couple of cars that look like little tin cans under there, too. But the root ball... When the tree was blown over, the root ball came out. And so there's probably 10 feet to the edge of the tree that you could just walk under. Here's this massive 8-foot tree 10 feet above you. And the root ball sticking up. And there's a car hanging on the root ball about 30 feet, 40 feet in the air. Sticking up above, 20 feet above the ridge of a house. Because <laughs> the root system, had just the car was into the driveway. It took the concrete driveway and all the car. Now it's 40 feet in the air. What a massive windstorm that came through there that leveled trees some 135 miles inland. If we are solid in our own consciousness, it's like we set grain a certain way. We're not bendable. We're not pliable to God. We have to be pliable to Him. Not pliable to Satan. Not bending over to our wants and our desires. We become set. No, I want that. Here comes the wind. We will be uprooted. Because it's something that we wanted and we're the wrong kind of tree. There is, when I went out to work claims, amazingly, the pine trees, they're all towering up. They're nice and lofty and beautiful, right? They have limbs stripped out of them and they're just laying over like toothpicks and they got a small root ball. They didn't last very long. They look stately. They look solid. They don't last at all. They didn't last near as long as the live oak did. But there's a statement that God makes. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Cedar puts out a different root structure. Cedar is also kind of resistant to rot and mildew and all that stuff. But he makes this one statement in Psalms 92.12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. You know what the palm tree does? 165 mile hour winds. He goes, okay. And he just leans over. Root ball doesn't come out. Its limbs are designed in such a way, just like an umbrella that goes upside down. It says, okay, here I am. It spreads its limbs out with the direction of the wind. And after the storm... By the next day, the tree that was leaned over like this has come back up, and its limbs are now still there and hanging rightly. Its structure is somewhat knit together and fibrous. It's running different directions. It feeds off of and supplies its energy in the same way the oak tree does, but it does something different in its cellular structure that makes it pliable. God wants us to be pliable when he speaks to us and says, don't do that. I mean, some of us get some of our limbs just stripped plum off of us and broke and our roots pulled out of the ground when he says, don't do that. And we disagree with his instructions or we try to domesticate him. You know what? We domesticate him. Our God is our domesticated God, don't you? When you get ready to go on a trip. Now, now look, God, we're going to be gone for uh, two weeks and uh, it's fixing to be cold weather. Uh, would you please make sure that my plumbing doesn't freeze and uh, take care of this and take care of this. You just pray up a storm over the house. And I'm sure the Lord is saying, uh, is there anything else you'd like me to do for you while you're gone? That's not a good prayer, is it? We're supposed to be asking him and saying, God, where are you? And I'm coming to you and I'm going to do it your way and I'm going to follow you and I'm, I'm, I'm going to build in you. Instead, we're always after the pleasures of this life and our own purposes and those things will not. 
be productive for us. They will only produce for us those things that cause the storms in life. I find it strange that I've never seen anybody break when Satan asked them to do something. Instead, yeah, you bet, I'll do that. They become invincible. <laughs> but when God asks us to do something, it's like he has to uproot us. It's like the limbs have to break before we'll do it his way. Where do we get that stiff neck from? And what's his remedy? The remedy is to build our lives in Jesus. To build them in him. If we're building in him, then he has control. He is the one that determines where we go and when we go and how we go and when we don't go and what we do participate in, what we do see and what we don't see. And if I will listen to him and learn to be led by the Spirit, then healing will come. Healing will come even to those things in our childhood, even to those things our parents did that we had no control over in our Spouses did that we had no, and our children did that we had no, and our teachers did that we had no control. He has healing for all those things, and those are no excuse for building in the sand. We lie to ourselves if that's an excuse for building in the sand, and we only set ourselves up for another fall because he says the winds are going to come and they're going to beat on your house and let me help you with almost like tears looking down upon me just like I was nearly breaking in tears when I was looking at Milo and said, I don't know how to help you. I meant that with everything that's in my heart. I want to help this little guy. He is a loving, kind, gentle, the lovingest little pooch I've ever met in my life. And God looks at you and he sees certain qualities of his son in you and says, I love you so much. I don't know how to help you on the sand. I can't keep the storms away on the sand. I've made a hiding place for you in my son. Why won't you stay in him? He's pleading with us, with all of his heart, pleading with us to be a part of his son. Our son is solid. There's no storm that can take him down. And I always am succumbed to the enemy of getting me to do something out there on the sand. And I go further and further and don't realize it until the rock, I can't see it and I forget about the rock. I want to talk about the rock, and oh yeah, I got a piece of that in my pocket. You want to see my rock? <laughs> well, when the storm comes, drop it on a sand and stand on it and see what happens. It's not the rock. If you're not living in Jesus Christ, it's not the rock. You don't have deliverance. You don't have salvation. Salvation is where? In Him. And if you're not in Him, let's stop fooling ourselves. Church in Philadelphia was the only church that was doing things right. Every other church disappeared. One of them lost their salvation altogether. The others entwined in all kinds of false doctrine and letting weird stuff go on and letting wickedness go on. But the Philadelphia church, God, Jesus Christ makes a statement. I have opened a door for you that no man can shut. We need that door into the celestial heavens where we can see our king open. We need it to see the solidness of him. We need it to get the rules and the understanding of my life is in you. Keep the door open, O oh Lord. And other guys didn't get the door open. And the other guys, every one of them went through the great tribulation that took place then and God gives us the same warning he said the tribulation's coming you're on the edge of it the last days are here become like the Philadelphia church because if you do I'll protect you from those things if you do not become like them either I will remove your lampstand from my presence altogether or you will go through the great tribulation and then turn to me our efforts in our life are to become like the church in Philadelphia I have much more to say about this, maybe in our next session. But your God is calling you to the rock. Calling you for responsibility for building on the sand. I don't go stand out in the sand and cry. Come to the rock. And if you don't know how, we can teach you how to come to the rock. And stay on the rock and build yourself in the rock. 
so that your God can set you free from everything that the sand has to offer. And your God can build you a mansion on the rock, a home, a life that's solid, that will not keep collapsing and collapsing and collapsing and collapsing. He wants that for you. If you had children, they're constantly doing it upside down. They're poor. They're living on the streets. They got nothing. Never will have anything because of their ways. It's a tragedy to your heart to think, why do you live that way? Why won't you become solid? God himself is crying out to us. You're my children. Come and do it my way. Become solid in me. Live your life in me. Have your being in me. Learn to walk in my spirit. Now, walking in the spirit is not us going, woo. Walking in the spirit is the Lord said, Curtis, yes, Lord. Is it, you know that thing you said uh, to that person? Would you go tend that and tell them you're sorry? And it wasn't of me. I, yes, Lord. I'll go do that. I go, that's walking in the spirit. That's with the door open and me hearing what to do. That's walking in the spirit. Yes, there are spiritual gifts. But the spiritual gifts don't speak to me and lead me. The Holy Spirit speaks to me and lead me. If I'm listening, if I'm not willful, if I'm not in sand, if I'm not on the sand, He will call me from the rock. But all I hear is the... I can't hear the warning of you're in the water and there's sharks coming. <laughs> the Lord wants to get you into a safe position with him. Come and build with him. Give your life to him. Shall we pray? Lord, when I look at myself sometime, I think, what are you going to do with yourself, Curtis? I don't know what to do with myself, Lord. Except come to you and fall into your arms. I say, here I am, oh Lord. I know I wiggle, I squirm, I fight. I know my ears don't want to hear the truth. But, oh, Lord, teach me your ways of how I can cling to the rock. Live in the rock. Have my being in the rock. And in life itself. Help me, Lord. You can't. I can't help my little pooch. But you're God and you can help me. You're the great God that wants to deliver me. You're the great God that come to rescue me. You're the great God that come to pay all the penalties. You're the great God that has made a future for me. You're the great God that wants me to build a house. You're the great God that wants to supply the material to build on the rock. You're the God that provides the rock. You're our great God. That'll help my mind submit itself to you and to your ways for they are not my ways I desire them to be though help me in Jesus name I pray Amen 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 Anybody like a little prayer about your storm season? <laughs> if you'd like a little prayer about how to get on the rock Elton and I will be here to pray for you other than that, you're dismissed. We have prayer tonight at 5 o'clock. Prayer. We have prayer. Tonight at 5 o'clock. Last call. Y'all be sure to fellowship with one another before you depart. Love on each other. Help each other. I'd like to thank you guys for joining us out there. God bless you.